This week on A Lively Experiment, another shocker in the Rhode Island political universe as David Cicilline says he's giving up his seat in Congress. And now the race is on to see who will replace him. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS. Get your scorecard out as our panel of reporters join us for analysis of this evolving story. They include Boston Globe columnist Dan McGowan, Target 12 reporter Steph Machado, and Ian Donis, political reporter for The Publix Radio. Hello and welcome to Lively, I'm Jim Hummel. Well, so much for a quiet off election year. David Cicilline set in motion what promises to be a repeat of what we saw last summer when Jim Langevin announced he was calling it quits. But this time an insanely large number of people say they are considering a run for his house seat. More on the how the election uh, to replace Cicilline will play out a little later, but first, Dan, let me begin with you. We were texting Monday night, and Dan said, I may or may not be chasing something that could be the biggest story of the year, which I thought was a little dramatic. And then 12 hours later, it turned out to be. When did Cicilline go into the foundation first come on your radar screen? Uh, only about last week, uh, I started to hear a little bit about just rumors, mostly about, I, I've been chasing the story of who's gonna be the next foundation director for a, a lot while, of people wanted it. A lot, a lot of people wanted the job, it's high profile, it's you know very interesting because they're, you know, they play a major role in lots of different kind of areas in Rhode Island, you know, policy type things. Heard last week that this was a possibility, I didn't believe it, quite frankly, um, but by the time I was texting you, I was fairly confident that it was that that it could happen and uh, you know from from everything that David Cicilline from what he told me uh, in an interview this week he's basically said yeah they approached me in December we got a little bit serious about it the last couple of weeks it was attractive there's obviously a bunch of reasons for him to take the job he's gonna make more money uh, a lot more money three times as much at least uh, as he makes in Congress and then of course you know you can't underestimate the fact that He's, he's in the minority party now. He's not on track to be in a kind of a high-level leadership position, even if they do take back, the Democrats do take back. So what's he so, doing? Yeah, it made a lot of, I think it makes a lot of sense because he sort of likes to be the center of attention. This gives him a chance to do that. You had a chance to talk to him too? Yeah, Cicilline was clearly open to a new chapter in his life. You know, you see some people in Washington who are in elected office who just want to stay there until they're in their 80s. He had a, a different outlook on it. It's a good opportunity for him at a good time. As Dan said, there are various factors, the Democrats being in the minority in the House. Cicilline has been blunted in some of his efforts to move up in the hierarchy. It's probably been a little bit frustrating for him that Catherine Clark of Massachusetts, now the number three Democrat, uh, joined Congress after him and has been able to move up faster. And, you know, this is a, a high profile role, as Dan said, with a lot more money. It enables him to argue on key issues in Rhode Island. So you can see why this was an appealing opportunity for Cicilline. And, and it was kind of a spectacular fail that he took on Jim Clyburn, which seemed it, it, he's got good political sense. That didn't seem to be such a smart move. And then he and he was trying to take out Clyburn, who was, the, you know, been there forever. South Carolina delivered by for Biden and that failed. And I wonder if that kind of nudged him also. That seemed like a miscalculation at the time. But I think it's more a cumul an accumulation of things. Cicilline has been in the House for 12 years. What's he going to accomplish if he stays there longer? I mean, the D Republicans have been in the majority for a lot of his time in Washington. He hasn't been able to make a lot of headway on issues like tech monopolies. So he clearly wanted to go in a different direction. Yeah, I'll say, like, you know, I was shocked initially, like everyone else, but my shock wore off a lot when I saw the $650,000 salary he's going to be making at the Rhode Island Foundation. And look, people say leading the Rhode Island Foundation is like being the mayor without the responsibility. I mean, you have the ear of all the powerful people in the state. You have the ability to give out money to causes that are important. And you have, uh, a, you're in the room, right? You're in the room for big decisions. The Rhode Island Foundation has had a role in the state takeover of the schools and all these major um, events, and he will remain in the public eye for as long as he is in that role. And if there's, I don't know if he's going to run for office ever again, but if there's an opportunity to run for Senate or run for an office in the future, he certainly won't be someone that everyone's forgotten about. Now we have, you know, we, we talked about this on the Globe podcast. I mean, two years ago, if you had said, 
Uh, who do you think is going to go first out of the four? You would think Jack Reed, even though he's turned down cabinet, you know, rumblings and all of that. We weren't even sure we were going to have two congressional seats. And now Seth Magaziner is going to be the senior member. Yeah, I mean, in, in, it's a real blow to Rhode Island in terms of just your, you know, your, your seniority status when you lose Jim Langevin, who, you know, was quiet. A lot of people at home kind of, were, you know, wondered sometimes, oh, what, what was Jim Langevin doing? But being there is, the th particularly with Democrats, even more so. So than Republicans, being, you know, longevity really matters among the Democrats. So I think this is a bit of a challenge. But you know what? It's a very big chance for Seth Magaziner to, you know, step up, be loud, and, and actually, you know, he's, he doesn't have, he's not going to have David Cicilline to say, hey, maybe tone this one down. You know, this is a chance for Seth Magaziner to kind of really emerge, um, at, you know, as a star in the Democratic Party. So I, I think it's a great opportunity for him. You got that great task of doing the sidebar on <laughs> now who's who. running. <laughs> so the globe, you can't see this, but <laughs> there's two dozen people maybe, and then this is the not running. And I'm like, the only person not on here is my postman. It's like <laughs> no, and, he's on there. I see. Oh, oh, wait a minute, he's a last minute addition. So if you want to go to the globe, they have the running. So now the fun and the speculation begins. Right, exactly. And listen, you know, at this point, it feels like everyone is exploring a run because they don't have to give up their current elected seat to run for this office, which makes it very different from the CD2 open seat that we had last year. If you were going to run for that seat and you were in elected office, you were taking a gamble, you had to give up your current seat. Right now we have many you know, state senators, state reps, even city town council people saying, I'm exploring a run for Congress. I think the question is, who are the big names that are going to get in, like Helena Folks, like Sabina Matos? A lot of people are talking about Gabe Amo, who's a White House official who doesn't have name recognition but could potentially have the um, connections to raise a lot of money. So it's all about the money. You can if. 25 people are not going to actually run for Congress, um, but anyone can say they're going to run at this moment because, again, it's an odd number year. They are not giving anything up by exploring a run right now. And the declaration won't happen until Oh, yeah. Right. I, I agree with everything Steph said, and this is a seems like a real godsend for Helena Folks. I mean, she ran a very competitive race to Governor McKee in the Democratic primary last year, came up a little bit short. A lot of us think if she had been a little more aggressive, the outcome might have been different. She's been looking for a way to keep her name in the political realm and look being on the Johnston School Building Committee might, <laughs> might be nice but it's no comparison to being in CD1 so she could be very strong. Another big question is whether House Speaker Joe Shikarchi decides to get in. He is in Warwick not currently in CD1 but he has a huge war chest. He has a, a strong political network. The question for him really is whether it's better to be one of the most powerful political figures in Rhode Island or to be one of hundreds of members of Congress in D.C., but his decision is one that we'll all be watching very closely. I also think about Helena Folks, you know, being a governor as opposed to a legislator, which is there. there is a little bit of a, but, you know, she has deep ties in Washington. Yeah, so. and she could still come back and, you know, uh, if she were to run and win election in CD1, she could conceivably still run for governor down the road. Well, isn't this, this is why, I, for me, it makes a lot of sense for Helena Folks because here's the challenge. She it's, has, has signaled already that she really likes this idea of wanting to be the governor. But you're looking a couple of years down the line. So does Seth Magaziner. So does Seth Magaziner. <laughs> right? You're looking a couple of years down the line. It will be very difficult if all things stay the same for a Democrat to take on the Democratic incumbent governor without major union support. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much money Helena Folks has. In this case, it's a landing spot, as Ian said, and potentially then you say, okay, down the line, 2030. 2030, lots of options. You could run for governor, you could potentially run for U.S. Senate, things like that. So being in the Congress, I think, mm -hmm. probably is the smart landing spot for and, her. And with Seth Magaziner, who did switch from the governor's race to Congress, Congress. That was because Democrats thought they were going to lose that seat, the right. CD2 seat. It's a more conservative district. That seat could have gone to Republicans, and they needed a candidate that they thought could definitely win, and he was convinced to move from governor to Congress. Democrats are not afraid of losing the CD1 seat. They're pretty confident that it's going to stay blue. So there's a little bit more flexibility mm -hmm. in terms I mean, yes, they want a good candidate, of course, but there's a little bit more, you know, you're not feeling the pressure to i got to run for this seat because otherwise it's not going to stay blue. Everybody says it's not a big deal that you can run from another district. My feeling is it's a bad look. 
If I live in CD1, now I know Helena folks are saying she's buying a house in Providence or whatever, but you know, it was the whole Bob Wagan thing. He wound up moving from East Providence down to North Kingstown. Do you think that matters? So if somebody is in CD2 and they're running in CD1, does that become a campaign issue? I think it can, and I think people are underestimating. You know, everybody that we're talking to that's, you know, on our lists of who might but run. But Joe Sicarci is CD2. He's a CD2 guy. I think it can become a factor, especially when to, to Steph's point, when you don't have, I mean, Alan Fung's not walking through that door, right? You don't have the deep fear of potentially losing the seat. You're going to be looking for issues that separate you as a candidate. You're on the debate stage with eight other people. One way to really go after someone who is, you know, powerful. If Joe Shikarchi's on, that's the attack on Joe Shikarchi. That's the only one that really sticks to him. You're not even from here. You're a Warwick guy. Uh, and, and so I do think it will play if it's one of those people. Now, again, Helena Folks, somebody who she, she lived and grew up you know, in the first district, so she can at least make that And case. also has name recognition. Exactly. What do you think about that? I think it is an issue. As Dan said, it kind of goes to a question of authenticity. I mean, we're such a small state, you could throw a stone from one district into the other, but it could be a talking point if it can be used by one candidate against another. Steph, I was surprised, sitting on a million dollars, that Alorza immediately ruled it out. This would seem the perfect race for him. Yeah, and he has said he's not interested in, in being in Congress, so I think he had interest in being the governor at one point. He's but spending his, too much time with Omar? What's, his, what's, ta what's taking up his time now? He's working at the Roger Williams uh, University Law School, and I just think he likes being in that executive position. Once I don't, you he, get he that said he's taste. not interested in being a lawmaker. I you think, don't want to be number 435, I think, Yeah, right? I think once you get that taste, now there are different people. David Cicilline obviously was perfectly fine with it, but mm. I think Mayor Lorza, you know, he, he really liked being in charge, and if he's not going to be in charge, he doesn't need the politics. He, he's not obsessed with it the way someone like David Cicilline was. So then to round out this conversation, we, you had alluded to it, the Republican it almost reminded me, okay, who's going to be the sacrificial lamb? Because it's a, it's a more liberal district, and you have to have a lot of money. They're kind of in dis, not disarray, but Sue Sienke's leaving his party chair. There's no, they thought this was going to be the lock and load year. You almost wonder whether they have to find like a Mark Sicaria, who just kind of put his name in a couple of times because they had to have somebody. Anybody on your radar screen for well, the Republicans? I'm, cur I'm curious about Senate Minority Leader Cheska De La Cruz of North Smithfield. I had a little go around with her last year where I reported that she was going to run in CD2. She denied it a day later, and then she announced about a day after that that she was running. <laughs> and then she, <laughs> and then she pulled another day. And <laughs> right. Was the, was exactly. Over, right? So, you know, she's one of the few bright spots for the Republican Party in Rhode Island right now. And, you know, it, it's for her to decide whether running or staying in her current role is the better use of her time and energy. I, as we've said, you know, CD1 is a less conservative than CD2, so it could be a, a tough lift for a Republican and, you know, might be the smarter political course for her to stay put, but she's someone to keep an eye on. Yeah, the first district's kind of a, a little bit like Fairfield County in Connecticut where, you know, Rockefeller Republican types potentially, right. you're, you're actually a Republican for tax purposes and that's it. I could see a scenario where that argument gets made. Maybe there's somebody we're just not thinking of that that you know has a couple of million bucks and has some time to to handle this but it's just very very difficult to run on sort of the you know the trump maga kind of uh, uh policy and views because you're it's just not going to hold up in the first district final question how long is it going to so cicilline not leaving they can't call it until so the, there's all sorts of scrambling with phone calls and everything when do you think we're going to get a good idea of who the serious candidates are is that going to be April, early May? Well, the declaration deadline, depending on the timing for the election, is probably not going to be until July or August. Secretary oh, of State. Long. Yeah, Greg Amore is presented. Oh, you, yeah, two, you had an article yeah. on the timetable. Right, Greg Amore has presented two options to Governor McKee. One would have the primary be in August, the other in September, with the, the special election either in October or November. So, you know, you have to have a certain amount of time for declaration, for verifying signatures, all that. And and uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is one of the benefits for potential candidates, that they have a couple of months to gauge their support, try and raise money, raise their profile. So, But it's going to be later rather than sooner. This 
don't you think this is going to be a little bit? Remember last year, the, the I think the first person to announce was Ed Pacheco, and he, oh, and he yeah. went went yeah. forward and tried to raise the money. I think you're going to see a lot of the trial balloons, like the Ed Pacheco's of the world, who are going to go out. You're going to see lots of people file to open a campaign account. Yep. They're going to try to raise 150, 200 thousand dollars, show they've got some you know level of support. You talk to anybody who does fundraising, and they all tell they say, "Show me you can do it." They, that's what they tell candidates. But you're, a lot of these candidates are. Also going to find out that hey, I'm a city councilman. I can only raise thirty thousand dollars, and then you're not a factor. Yeah, but we're not going to see all the people on that list come July. No, filing. Hundred percent. Cross them off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but the final point is. You, in this race, unlike CD2, where all that PAC money came in from the outside because there were national implications, what do you figure? A million dollars could do this race? Yeah, I think, what do you guys think? I yeah. think a million bucks yeah. is probably yeah. way I mean, yeah. half a million. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just depends on how competitive it and, is. And with, a, and with a primary, if you had that August 8th primary, which I'm not a big fan of, I mean, you could win with, I don't know, 25% of the vote if yeah. you had multiple fields and well, half a million dollars. Well, that's the thing is the turnout. It's a special election. It's not a normal election where people know that they're going to go to the polls. So it could be a very low turnout election. Election, and you could win if there's a five, six person primary, you could win with a very small share of voters. Which is why we should say don't count out uh, some of these mayors, like Don Grebian, uh, Bob mm. De Silva in East Providence, because if you already have a little bit of a constituency, and if they get the other mayors to board, coalesce that's right. around it's that them McKee mafia. and get, yes. their, get, <laughs> their, get their, you know, yeah. people Dan out McKee to the polls. Dan will play a major role in this race sure. if he wants to, you know, coalesce them in the, the mayor's room. Yeah. All right, for the first time in 10 years, major changes to the access to public records law is being changed. Why is this important? Well, this is right in the wheelhouse of everybody who's sitting on this set. But more importantly, it's about transparency and how you know that your government works. Steph, you had a great article article outlining this. Um, it's, it lays out, I think, a pretty, uh, pretty aggressive agenda. I don't know how much of it's going to get through, but of the changes, what were some of the top things that struck you? Well, one of the biggest ones is that elected officials all this time, their emails and communications have been exempt from the public records law, which seems like that's exactly whose communications you would want to see yeah. because they are making laws. And so this, uh, making big decisions if they're, a, you know, a mayor or a governor. And so this proposal would um, make elected officials, uh, you know, correspondence, meaning mainly their emails, public. It would still exempt their conversations with their constituents. So the constituents could still feel comfortable emailing their state rep. But that would be a huge change. And of course, it's elected officials who will be voting on this. So we'll see if they're but willing to do that. you know how I that. found that out? When Sarah Palin, remember her emails came out? Yeah. I mm. Every reporter immediately said, hey, I want whoever the governor's emails. They immediately said, oh, I'm sorry, those, uh, those are exempted under... Uh, access to public records. It's yeah. No yeah, it's yeah. funny we're talking about David Cicilline because when he left City Hall, That's there was right. an effort to get his emails about the city's financial condition and how he was talking about it. And that could have offered an important window on what was happening. But under the state's public records law at the time, those could not be uh, lawfully demanded by reporters. Well, and what ended up happening in that scenario was Mayor Tavares's team uh, at the time, did in fact end up releasing kind of partial emails, and all you really got was a sense of kind of the gossip that they all <laughs> spread about each other, which is what we want, right? Well, that's yeah. fascinating. You didn't actually get a lot. You, you never really get the smoking gun. We have to cover this up. They usually yeah. don't they, write that. We, yeah. we can't. Or they redact it when they're. Yes. We can't yeah. make payroll next <laughs> week. <laughs> We're broke. Nine one one calls. Yeah, I mean the nine one one calls have been exempted from from uh, becoming public in. Rhode Island, those could potentially become public under this bill. And then also the body camera video, which, by the way, is public, but the last time, you know, it's been so long since the APRA law was updated that this technology just wasn't even considered. So they're also trying to update it in light of this new technology to make it clear that body-worn cameras are, the video is public record, yes, it's subject to redactions, but then also that when police are accused of um, using force inappropriately, that that video has to be released within 30 days, according to the proposal. So we'll see what the final bill says, but that is huge because we have seen police accused of using force inappropriately, and then it's months and months and months, and the video isn't released. And when it finally comes out, it can it's show something really yeah. egregious. So here's the story on how the 911 got passed. There was a state senator years ago, he will go unnamed, he was, worked as a lawyer, he had a client who got embarrassed. 
because there was a call. It got broadcast on all the TV stations like we've seen. He immediately drafted legislation that said ban all 911 calls unless you get a court order or the person making the call agrees to release it. So in your worst moment, you're going to go, you know, I think Steph Machado should get that and she should be able to broadcast that. And that's been the law where you go to any other state, most states, Massachusetts, you get them immediately. All these places where the 911 call could really, on the news that night or the next night, and in Rhode Island, we've been under a shroud of darkness for 15 years. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, obviously, sadly, sometimes the person who made the 911 call is no longer alive because of whatever tragic thing they were calling about and so you can't get their permission to release it and so that that weird um, clause where you have to get the permission of the person who made the call in order for it to be a public record has has never made a lot of sense um, I'm sure there will be people who will say this is an invasion of privacy these are people's worst moments that they are making this phone call but that, in that, that moment they released. are a public figure using public resources and there can be a real public interest in this information yep. my colleague Lynn Arditi did some excellent reporting in where a person ha who had made 911 calls or their family was willing to make that available because it shed light on a lack of sufficient training by being some on, and being by some of the too. Right, right, yeah. by some of the 911 operators. So that shows the importance right. of this it's information. It's not just the call that's being made, but it's the um, way how, it's how, how it's handled exactly. by the 911 operator who is a public uh, employee. The problem with the proposal is they could be released if there's good cause. Who's deciding what the good cause is? What is your biggest frustration with the open records law right now? Oh, it's 100% the emails. I think that's the, the, the thing that I find to be really frustrating. Well, yeah, that and the other one, I guess I have multiple. because I the, have so many. The other, one I would, <laughs> the other one I would say is that the just the flexibility that, that, that attorneys have, or attorneys working for you know government bodies to say, you know what we the, what we don't really like that. That's an uncomfortable question you're asking. We're gonna put you off for 30 days. You know, 10, 10 initially, and, and then the and then the extra 20, 20. and right. they do it. So you got a long single time. Excluding yes. holidays and weekends, so you could go to six, seven weeks. That's right, and it happens, and it's all. It can be the easiest thing in the entire world. I mean, we're going through this right now with the Providence School Department over some emails that were sent, and. It t they push it off, push it off, push it off. They act like it has, you know, it, it, it's so much work to redact five emails. It's ridiculous, and th that's a big Well, concern. they also use it as a weapon. We saw that with Patricia Morgan. They were even a state legislator. They're going to charge her $3,000 for some work. The other thing, Ian, I think, and you and I have been kind of line reporters out there, well, Steph, too, but, I mean, in, in the print, when I work for the journal, you go in and a lot of the town and city clerks are not trained. And mm -hmm. so you'll Gosh. go in, like Joe Public will go in and they'll say, why do you want that information? You can't ask that. You, you don't even have to put your name down. And a lot of them don't know that. And I think the or front lines, it has to come from the attorney general or whoever down. Do you find that too? Or? I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, Attorney General Nerona does do a yearly thing to try and inform local officials about this. And I think there is a little bit of increased knowledge about it. But as Dan said, there is a lot of discretion seemingly with some of this open record stuff. And if, if the government wants to try and cover stuff from being released to reporters, they, they often have significant discretion. And then they put the onus on us. Is Are we really going to fight it legally? Or are we gonna, is our company going to spend the money? Well, particularly right. the money, because that, yes. they, they are calling your bluff, essentially, to and say, say hire a you, lawyer yes. and go ahead. Yeah. And the, you know, if you want to file an appeal with the attorney general's office because you feel like they violated APRA, you can do that. But we'll in my experience, <laughs> it takes a year right. for yeah. the appeal to be adjudicated. The story is over. The thing has happened that you were trying to get records about. Yeah. All right. Let's go to uh, outrages and or kudos. Mr. Donis, what do you have today? My outrage is some recent revelations about Fox News. This came out in a lawsuit that some of the Fox News personalities like Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, and Sean Hannity, who were supporting the Trump line on TV about a stolen election. Turns out behind the scenes they were, you know, saying how ridiculous some of these assertions were in a completely different kind of way. And that was very revealing and it's pretty outrageous. Dan, what do you have? Uh, I thought Steph would go, so now I'm nervous. But no, my, uh, my you're a gamer. You gotta you gotta come like layman. We have three deep ready my, to go. My my biggest outrage is actually based on some of Steph's reporting that we've been seeing about the Providence school system. Uh, you know, some of the the frustration around the. Uh, the closing of the schools. It's not the closing of the schools that I find to be a problem. It's the transparency that we're not seeing from the Rhode Island Department of Education. Back a couple of years ago, state takes over the schools. The big argument was, oh, we got to get all the government bodies
bodies out of this. We have to, the, the city council is so ridiculous. The truth is, the, the city council, the school board, they actually held power to account. Now, we're not seeing it at all. It's completely outrageous. Are the schools, though, they're owned by the city? So it, what, is there a question about control? About whether, you, I know that's more of a curriculum thing, but that's a physical building. The buildings are owned and controlled by the city, but the school department, which is state controlled, can choose to leave the building, right? They can just choose to say, we're taking our kids out of the building and gonna educate them elsewhere, so yeah. Do you have an outrage or a kudo this week? Well, I'll stick with the APRA theme and say, I am just outraged about excessive redactions. I had a, we were just talking about, you could take six, seven weeks to get an APRA back. I just had one from the Providence School Department. They actually missed the deadline. And when I got it, it almost every word was redacted. Okay. Yeah. And it's very hard to appeal because you don't know what words are under the black marker. Um, but there it's is- Like this? Assault and battery with a magic marker, yes, as your colleague Tim White, Tim White says. Yes. Do they assault? charge you for the Sharpie too? No, they did not charge me any money for this APRA. And they typically don't. But the, yeah, the assault and battery with a magic marker can get really egregious. And if you don't know, which with our reporting, sometimes we do know what's under the redactions. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to appeal and I'm trying to work on it, but it can get really, uh, it, uh, what's the word, I'm, what's the word, the discretion. It's the discretion to redact anything you want and then call it work product or something like that. One of the few things we should be more like Florida. Florida is fully oh transparent. It is living up to the sunshine. The sunshine, yes. right? yeah. Hey, listen, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, what do you make of this kerfuffle at RIPTA? So, I mean, RIPTA has had its problems, and now Pat Crowley, not surprisingly, calling out Scott Avedesian, who's the longtime, if you haven't been following the story, longtime head of RIPTA. Some of the, uh, the uh, board members, the chairman of the board is, is defending him. What do you make of all this? This seems like one of those perennial Rhode Island issues where we're such a small state, it should be easier to have a robust public transit system, but instead it just doesn't function that well and there are funding issues. You know, we know uh, revenue is challenged by changing modes of transit. Some lawmakers like Senator Megan Coleman want to get a surtax to try and funnel more money to RIPTA. It would seem that there can be a way to usher in better public transit, but they're very competing visions right now. There's nobody who's happier about the David Cicilline news than Scott Afedishi. He thought, <laughs> he thought this right was going to lead. Yeah, yeah, he thought this might lead the week. You know what he should do? Nobody's is, asking Scott Afedishi if he's going to run for well, Congress. By the way, there's your landing spot. You want to leave? He's a Republican. He should go be the Republican <laughs> candidate for Congress. What do you make of this? You know, I haven't done a lot of reporting on this in terms of the political you know, discourse between Ruggiero and Avedesian, but I did think it was interesting that the transit riders are saying no. Yeah. They actually want to keep him in place and they're not interested in RIPTA going under the That's DOT. That's the bigger yes. issue, isn't yeah. it? The yeah. DOT yep. to them is like the devil, right? Well, because the DOT is the one that is has been spearheading this, let's get the buses out of Kennedy Plaza and they feel very attacked. Like, they just want to, they don't want to see us anymore, us bus riders, they want to shunt us off to the side. So Ruggiero doesn't have direct, the legislature doesn't have direct but there are appointments to the board, but it seems like he has pretty strong board support now, right? It seems like he has strong board support. And, you know, the the ability to complain loudly when you're the Senate president, it gets everybody's attention. Dan McKee doesn't owe Scott Avedesian anything. You know, if you think about who you're going to make a deal with, probably better to make it with the Senate president than the, you know, the embattled mem uh, leader of RIPTA. All right, guys, it was a fun half hour. As I put in my note, we tried to, we were trying to fit 10 pounds in a five pound sack, and I think we did it today. Ian, good to see you, and Steph, and Dan, congratulations. He didn't, Steph, he didn't go all, oh, I broke the story, and, uh, <laughs> but congratulations, that was a good story. Thank scoop. you. It was the story of the year so far, but we are only in February. Kudos to Dan. <laughs> yeah, kudos to Dan. Uh, folks, if you don't catch us Friday at uh, seven or Sunday at noon, Go online. We archive all of our shows at ripbs.org slash lively. It is going to be a crazy political year. We'll be all over it. And I hope you join us back here next week as the Lively Experiment continues. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.